I'm going to talk about just another a little story. It's a story that starts with an explosion and it moves through all the stages of loss and fear and confusion and intrigue and ultimately redemption. The story is 848 pages long, 16 chapters, and it was published about three years ago. And even its title is epic. The Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. <laughs> Dodd-Frank, yes, okay. So we're gonna talk about regulation a little bit. But all those elements are really truly there. It all started with uh, a big explosion. The markets exploded about five years ago. Uh, started in the subprime markets and it uh, moved through the system and ultimately swept up every facet of the financial sector. It touched all of us. It was, uh, it was a big explosion and a big loss. Trillions of dollars of market cap wiped out virtually overnight. Uh, we moved through to the confusion phase, which was there were so many things on the books that people didn't really know about, the, as they call it, the opaque OTC derivatives market. Uh, I think Lehman Brothers, they said something like 66,000 line items were on its derivatives book that needed to be unwound. So they, uh, they had to do a lot in order to do that. The government basically had to come in and backstop everything. That led to fear. A lot of fear and a lot of anger, too, as a matter of fact. Um, and ultimately, we had uh, a period of intrigue, I call it, and then redemption. Redemption is the Dodd-Frank Act. It was uh, written... Uh, in 2010, and it was uh, supposed to bring back uh, fairness and transparency to the industry. So, I talked about all of those things, but I left out the intrigue part. The intrigue part is uh, what happened afterwards, which is Dodd-Frank in its 848 pages was not so much a set of hard and fast rules about you're going to do this, this, and this. It's more of like a general framework, some guidelines, some, uh, some ideas for how the market should be. And then it basically said to the regulators, CFTC, SEC, FDIC, and a host of others, okay, here's what we'd like you to do. Uh, go talk amongst yourselves, talk to the market participants, propose finalized rules. You've got one year. Ready, set, go. And well, how's that working out? It's been three years. And uh, last I hear, they're about 40% of the way done. So we've got a long ways to go. But as my colleague John Lothian likes to always remind us, in 1929, we had a little crash as well. And they didn't get all of the regulations in place for that one until the Investment Company Act of 1940. So that was 11 years that it took. Um, it's now been three years since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act, five years since the worst of the financial crisis. So, you know, I guess maybe we're doing okay. Um, now, for the rest of my conversation, I'd like to talk about one specific part of the Dodd-Frank Act, because it's the part that uh, has the most direct relevance to our industry. Now, there are plenty of things in Dodd-Frank. There's, uh, of course, uh, financial stability. Uh, you've got consumer protection. You've got uh, uh, orderly liquidation and the Volcker Rule. And, and there's 16 titles, but, uh, but the one that's, that's more about what we're doing here is Title Seven, Wall Street Transparency and Accountability. Uh, and basically, what it can be boiled down to is three words. Execution, clearing, data. Execution, transparency of execution uh, on either a designated contract market, an exchange like this one, or a uh, what's called a swap execution facility, a new thing that was created by Dodd-Frank, but they didn't say what it was supposed to be, they just said, Let's have this thing. It's loosely based off of uh, what's called the interdealer broker model, which is a, a group of people who represent the OTC derivatives industry, and they go around and, and search for market participants and get best execution for people who need uh, OTC derivatives done for them. So that's uh, the basic gist of execution. Clearing and data. Getting, uh, moving to a system where there's real-time reporting of data in a place where regulators and people who are looking at the systemic risk of the uh, financial sector can look in and say, okay, here's, here's what we've got as a whole. So that's it, Title Seven, execution, clearing, data. So before I did this job, I actually worked uh, for about two decades uh, as a market maker, uh, most of it right here in this building, back there were trading floors up there. Um, 
And it's interesting because I could see sometimes the dichotomy between what happens in the transparent cleared marketplace and the non-cleared marketplace. Of course, we're trading all day long. We're trading uh, listed contracts. They all go through the, uh, the process of central counterparty clearing. Um, but sometimes in our spare time, we would maybe dabble in some unlisted things, such as like uh, how well you think the new Spider-Man movie is going to do at the box office this weekend, or uh, whether uh, how many 90-degree days are going to be in July, or how many cheeseburgers you think this troglodyte from the equities can eat. He says he can eat 20 in an hour. So you get a little bit of side action from people. Here's the bottom line about clearing. Seven words. And if you hear them, you knew you were in trouble. I'll pay you when he pays me. I'll pay you when he pays me. That's the big problem. Because you say, okay, well, I'll go to this guy. Uh, you need to pay him so he can pay me. Well, I'm not going to pay him until he pays me. And so it goes, and you finally go, and you find the one guy who's like, yeah, every, everything lasts to him. And you look, and there's like 20 bodies around this guy clearly saying, you need to get everything going. We realized then that because it didn't go through central counterparty clearing, uh, we all got back. There was a systemic risk. It was one guy who had basically put on this same trade 50 times with 50 different people. You think there's a liquid and orderly market. Turns out there's a default over there, and it's had a systemic ripple effect to everybody. So that was the essence of Title VII. Get rid of this, I'll pay you when he pays me. Because, you know, uh, AIG was kind of like in uh, credit derivatives what this guy uh, who owed everybody on the cheeseburger bet was, which was uh, they were willing to write this insurance to a lot of different people. And you can go through your VAR models and say, well, you know, we're not going to have, it says 4% default risk. The problem is if it's 4% on an annual basis, but then you have that tail, and you, I guess if you've had any statistics, you probably know, when you have that big tail risk and it, and it occurs, it's not 4%. It's more like maybe 60, 70, 80%. And if you were to that point where you were uh, pricing such that the risk was low, but then you have that fear, then that puts in place a big series of events where now this thing is underwater, now he needs to liquidate, now he needs to liquidate, and, and so on and so on. So we said, okay, we're not going to have that type of system anymore. So uh, that's the essence of Title VII. I'm probably thinking that you guys have heard enough of this regulatory talk and you're wondering, okay, well, how does this affect me? Not me, but the you we, the royal we. Uh, because you're coming up through this and you're saying, okay, well, are we required to pick up the slack from, uh, from you guys? And the answer is no. There's plenty of room to, uh, to go from here in that uh, there are lots of opportunities for people to uh, actually still write these rules. As we mentioned, they're only about 40% of the way done. And also uh, people who can innovate. We need innovators. Now, there's another innovation here in, uh, that's happening. It's, uh, they call it the futurization movement. Have you heard the term futurization? You know, it's basically taking uh, products that are uh, able to be standardized a good bit will move into more of like a futures model rather than a swaps model because uh, there are some margin capital efficiencies for doing that. And that's one of those things that was like an innovation that you know a lot of people said, well, why didn't I think of that? You guys are the kind of people who could think of that. So that's just, uh, those are a couple ideas on how there's actually going to be room for a lot of different people. Now, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about in the, in the uh, swaps thing is I know a lot of people say, well, why has it taken so long to get these rules done? Does everybody know what a, what a swap is? Does anyone know what a swap actually is? All right, no hands raised. Uh, that's okay. The, uh, the regulators didn't know either. Uh, but it took them actually two years to figure out, well, what is a swap? And uh, yeah, sure, you can say, well, on the, uh, on the face value of it, then it's most simple form. It's a... It's a uh, uh, swap of cash flows in its most general form, a fixed or a floating, but you're trying to write rules on that. How, well, how do you write that in such a way that it captures what you need, but not what you don't need? Insurance. Well, you know, your simple insurance contract is basically a, uh, uh, a fixed payment for a floating contingent liability 
Uh, so isn't that a swap? Yeah, but could you imagine if you said, okay, well, I've got to go pay my auto insurance bill, uh, but I need to do it on a designated contract market or, or a swap execution facility, and I need to make sure that I've uh, adhered to all of the uh, reporting requirements and registration and all the umpteen other things, I think 23 core principles for swap execution facilities. So, yeah, if you, so they said, no, it's okay. It's a consumer transaction. You weren't going to be falling under that anyway. But it's still, they were basically saying, insurance, we don't want those to be swaps. But what about credit default swaps, which is basically an insurance against uh, a company going under, yeah, well, that is a swap. So it, you, you can imagine uh, how long that would actually take for them to do that. And that's just one little thing, the most basic thing. Well, what's a swap? What, what are we regulating here? And so when you think of all the things that they had to invent, and they have had to invent some things, and some things are actually still being invented. Talk about innovation. Um, such as, I mentioned the swap execution facility had not been defined yet. Uh, a lot of the uh, reporting things have not been invented yet. When you think of um, the fact that, uh, that they're trying to move to a real-time reporting system, a lot of the, the things that are done in systems had not been invented yet. There was something called the legal entity identifier, which is a whole system of standardization of, okay, well, who's doing what in this business? So um, again, there's plenty of room for innovation in all facets of this industry. So uh, we started with the story motif. I'll end with the story motif. This is a book that's continuing to be written, and it's uh, got room for plenty of other voices in here, so I invite you all to write your own chapter. <laughs>